Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is a video about transverse shear stress. So we know when we have a beam, you know, when we have a beam, something subjected to bending, we have two types of stresses. We have flexural stresses, which are normal stresses, and then we have shear stresses, specifically transverse shear stresses that get that tau symbol, okay? So this is a video all about tau. So we're not thinking about flexural beam stresses, but transverse shear stresses in beams. Let's get all this out of here. All right. Here's the idea. Each one of these six shapes represents a cross-sectional area that has been subjected to a shear force V, okay? So this is a cross-sectional area. Each one of these shapes, we have a square, a T-shape, a channel, a cylinder, solid cylinder, okay? We have a hollow rectangle and a little anti-symmetric Z-shape. Okay, and what we want to do is figure out how to determine Q and lowercase t. So our shear stress equation tau, it comes in two forms. I'll show both since some of you may have found my channel that aren't actually in my class. Um, this is the way that I always teach it. So V for shear force. Q for a statical moment of area, um, I for moment of inertia, T for thickness or width of the cross section. Another common symbol in that denominator is B. Um, so you may think of this as a T, you may think of this as a B, but everyone is pretty consistent with the use of Q up here in the numerator for the um, transverse shear stress formula that we have here. So this video is all about Q and all about T. How do we compute these really important quantities and get them right every single time? That is our mission today. All right. Um, for each one of these, the direction of the shear force has been cartooned for you. So in all six of these, the direction of the shear force is down and the axis of bending is shown. This happens all the time. The shear force direction by definition is perpendicular to the centroidal axis of bending. Each of these blue lines that I'm tracing, that is the centroidal axis of bending. It also can be called the neutral axis or the neutral surface. And note the relationship, the direction of the shear force is by definition perpendicular to that line. That's an important thing to note. Okay, we're going to use the grid to get dimensions. So all of these grid lines in this exercise are spaced at 10 millimeters. So that square is 10 millimeters, this square is 10 millimeters, and then the big ones from here to here, of course, that would be 50. So we can kind of think of these dimensions as 50 millimeters a piece. Okay, what we want to do is figure out Q and T, and I will zoom into our first one. This one's already kind of been done for you, but we can go ahead and work it out, okay? Okay. What I want you to do is imagine that you had a tiny pair of scissors, a tiny pair of scissors. They have a little pin right there, they look something like that. Okay. And with your tiny pair of scissors, what I want you to do is cut through the cross section coincident to the point of interest. In this case, we have this point on the cross-sectional cross plane A. We want to know what's happening there. So cut through A with your tiny scissors parallel to the neutral axis or axis of bending. Okay, so we get out our, our little scissors and kind of cut through that line. We hatch the area above or below. And choose the area below. Of course, this first one's kind of been done for you, which is why I'm just tracing over the lines. That's my partial area. Okay, this is my partial 
area that we will use to compute the transverse shear stress at A using the equation VQ over IT or VQ over IB if you're using that alternate notation. Okay, the basic idea here is that T, the thickness or width, is the amount of material, material you cut with your scissors. Okay, so we cut from left to right, we cut across 50 millimeters. So for this first one, the answer is 50 millimeters of thickness. Now we want to do our Q calculation. Our Q is defined as the partial area times the distance. Okay, the distance is defined as follows. You want to mark the center. You want to mark the center of that partial area. There is the center of the partial area. And then figure out the distance between that centroid of the partial area and the axis of bending. That is what the distance D is. So in our case, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> my area is a rectangle. It has a base of 50 millimeters. It has a height of half of that. So 25 is there. Okay, so my partial area is a 25 by 50. My distance is simply half of 25. So 25 divided by 2. The units here, I have length cubed, right? So I have length times length for an area. I have another length term for a distance. Oops, I'm not dealing with inches here. I'm dealing with millimeters. Sorry about that. Millimeters cubed. OK. Now we're ready to multiply that out, and you will get 15.6, 10 to the third, or E, 3 millimeters cubed. Get some of this out of here to clean it up a list a little bit. All right, that is our first example. I will solve all of these for you so that you get lots of examples of this. And the best way to this to use this video, and honestly, so many of my videos, is to kind of start the video, pause it, copy down the problem statement, work it yourself, and then spot check with the video. That is the best way to learn. That is an active way to learn. If you are just passively watching and hoping that it's going to absorb, um, that is not an effective way to learn. All right, let's go ahead and do the next one. So we've got our little imaginary scissors out. We want to cut through our T-shaped cross section at B parallel to the axis of bending. So here are my little scissors. There is T. My thickness or width of the cross section at point B is equal to this length, which is 10 millimeters. That is the first part of your answer. Next up, let's figure out Q, our statical moment of area or first moment of partial area. We want to hatch the area above or below that point. I'll pick the area below. I want to figure out the centroid of that rectangular area. It's right there. I want to measure the distance between the axis of bending and the center of that partial area. B, you can tell graphically, is located 10 millimeters, I'm sorry, 20 millimeters up from the bottom fiber. That means that this distance is 10 millimeters, half of 20, and this one is 24. We're ready to do our Q calculation. Q is equal to a partial area times a distance. Our partial area is the rectangle we shaded blue. It has a base of 10. It has a height of 20. 
our distance between the centroid of our partial area back to our axis of bending, that is 24. Multiply these numbers out and get 4.8 E, three millimeters cubed. There is an answer for you. Okay, let's go to the next example. Again, pause the video, try it yourself, and then spot check. That is a much more effective way to learn than popping popcorn, sitting back and kicking it on your phone and just hanging it out and letting me talk to you. All right, get out your imaginary scissors. We're going to take our scissors and cut right there through C, but parallel to the axis of bending which in turn is perpendicular to the direction of the internal shear force, super important geometric relationships. So my thickness is 10 millimeters. That is my first answer. Now let's do Q. I need to hatch the area above or below. I'm gonna pick the area above, C. It's kind of like after you use your imaginary scissors to cut that piece off, then you figure out, oh, okay, what's the area? There is the center of that partial area. And so I want to measure the distance from the centroid of the partial area back down perpendicular to the axis of bending. Okay, so this C channel has total height of 50. So there's 25 millimeters up to the top fiber there. This top chunk has a height of 10 millimeters. Get some of this out of here. Okay, and so this distance that I seek is equal to 25 minus half of 10. That gives me a distance of 20 millimeters. Q is equal to my partial area times my distance. That area has a base of 100 millimeters all the way from here back to here. So we have 100, height is 10, and my distance term is 20. And there is our Q that we would use. We would plug these two values in to compute the transverse shear stress at C using the equation VQ over IT. The shear force is the one right here. Oops, that didn't work. One right there on the cross section. My Q area times distance, you would plug in 20 E3 millimeters cubed. Your thickness is here, and your moment of inertia is about that centroidal axis, the axis of bending. Okay, so basically, this problem is just to set you up to perform this equation well by focusing on the two pitfalls, errors related to Q, errors related to T. Let's do the final three examples. We've got a nice circle here, a beautiful circle, if I do say so myself. Looks like it's got a diameter of 50, so a, I'm sorry, a, yeah, 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 diameter of 50, diameter of 50, and that means a radius of 25, so I'll just kind of write that to the side. All right, get out your scissors. How much material do I cut? I want to go coincident with D, parallel to the neutral axis. I just use my scissors to cut that circle in half. T is equal to 50 millimeters. Next up, let's do our partial moment of area. As before, I pick the area above or below And hatchet. I'll just pick the area below. Oops, not like that. I won't be gone. Rectangles. There we go. All right. So there's my area below. That's the partial area that is required to figure out what the transfer shear stress is at point D. Let's go ahead and set that up. 
Q is equal to a partial area times a distance. All right, what's the area of half a circle? Well, that's pi r squared divided by 2. Okay, and what is my distance between the center of a semicircle, which is going to lie there? Let's think about that for just a second. Okay, so I'm looking at this area, just this partial area right here, this semicircle. And so I'm thinking about, okay, it's got a centroidal axis here of that partial area. It has a centroidal axis here. That's a plane of symmetry. I would have to, to write out that integral to figure out what that distance is. This is one that it is okay to memorize. The distance between the base of a semicircle and the centroid of the semicircle is equal to 4 r over 3 pi. Okay, so that's one to, to memorize, although honestly it's not quite so necessary because you're about to see that things get simplified further. Um, I'm going to go ahead and plug that distance in for this term in the equation below. So we have our partial area that's in the first parentheses, put in the distance 4r over 3 pi, and we note that the pi's go away. We can take that out of that and turn that one into a 2, and so we get an expression of 2 thirds r cubed for the first partial moment of area or the statical moment of area for a solid circle. Okay, the shortcut of course doesn't work for a hollow circle or any other shape, but for a solid circle it happens to work out like this. And at this point we can just plug in. We're going to do two thirds. That radius we said was 25 millimeters. We want to cube it. And all of that turns out to be 10.4 E3 millimeters cubed. All right, moving right along. Next example, we have a rectangular hollow box. I would probably call this a box beam. And we want to know what's happening at point E. What is the transverse shear stress? All right, <clears throat> we need our scissors out. And think about this, I need to cut parallel to, excuse me, I need to cut parallel to the axis of bending in a line coincident with E. And this is maybe a detail that I didn't mention earlier because I didn't need to until now, but I need to cut this cross section into two pieces. Okay, so in other words, I can't just cut here. That would be a common error to say, oh, my thickness is 10 millimeters. Instead, I also have to cut over there. So how much material am I cutting? I'm not cutting anything here. That's just air. It's void. So 10 plus 10, 20 total. That's the first part of our answer, 20. Now we're ready to do Q, our partial moment of area. We could pick the area above this line. Here's what that would look like. I could pick all of this area. Or I can pick all the area below. And I'm going to choose to do that. Because I've taught this enough to know that students typically make fewer errors when they pick the area that is like far away from the axis of bending. Because when students pick this area, the one that kind of you know intersects or overlaps with the axis of bending, there just tend to be more errors. You'll get the exact same answer, I promise, but there are more errors. So I'm gonna stick to the way that usually works best. All right, so here's the area that I want. I'm subdividing it into little rectangles as I go. So I've got this piece, this piece and then this piece. 
Okay, I need all those areas to determine Q. Q is equal to, and this time I'm going to have to use the summation symbol. So the sum of my partial areas and their distances. I'm going to have three here. Let's put a centroid for each of these three partial areas. And then I want to measure back from that centroid to the axis of bending. I'll call this shape one. I'll call that shape two. So I have a distance one. I'll have a distance two. Move my equation over a little bit. Okay. And this will be shape three. Here is my distance three. Okay, so as I think through Q for this problem, I'm thinking A1, D, 1 plus A, 2, D, 2 plus A, 3, D, 3, la, 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 la. After that, it's just a big plug and chuck exercise. So area one has a base of 10. It has a height of 20. Just looking at that little rectangle. D1 by inspection is 20. I'm just going to, by inspection, realize that when I do that for shape one, I'll get the same thing for shape two. So I'll just double that term that I just derived. No big deal. It's going to add a two in the mix. Then for our last one, A3D3, let's see, that's a bigger shape. It has a base of 50 millimeters. It has a height of 20 millimeters. And D3 is one, two, three, four, 40 millimeters. Sum these two terms up, and you'll come up with 48E3 millimeters cubed. In order to kind of prove your understanding of this, a good thing for you to do just the once, a good thing for you to do just the once would be to take this area and see if you can come up with the same result, okay? You can subdivide this any way you like. So you could do this, squares here, rectangles here, rectangle here. That probably will produce more steps, but fewer errors. You could also do something like this. You do these two and this one, right? Then you're just measuring from the center of those pieces to the axis of bending. And you can also do this in terms of solids and voids. That way, that way you'll probably make, um, you'll have the highest probability of making an error, but you could do this as one solid. There is the center of the solid. And then this void, where the center of that void is right there. So this is probably a good one just to kind of play around with, try a couple different techniques. If you keep getting the same answer regardless of the technique that you use that means that you have got this concept down that's a good feeling all right last example six of six i've got this asymmetric or anti-symmetric anti-symmetric z shape it's anti-symmetric because if i were to fold the geometry twice once over this line and once over this line it would make this shape. Cut this one out of paper and fold it up yourself if you don't believe me, okay? But it's basically that shape reflected over those two axes, and we call this shape asymmetric for that reason. Now let's get into our T and Q calculations. So get out your little scissors, little imaginary scissors. You want to cut through the cross section so that it makes two pieces. You have to cut parallel to the axis of bending and coincident to F. But that doesn't really make sense, does it? Because you get out your scissors and you're trying to cut like right on the edge. Well, it doesn't work. You don't have to cut any material to separate this area from down here, which doesn't exist. 
Okay, so because F is down on the bottom extreme fiber, this is sort of a trick question. And so I'm just going to write T is not applicable because you don't have to cut anything. F is down at the bottom. So the whole point of doing these partial areas is to figure out what distance are you away from the axis of bending, what areas are in play once you make that horizontal cut, and here it's not applicable. You're down at the bottom fiber. In fact, you would get this answer if T is not applicable for any of these points at the bottom and any of these points at the top, right? All right. Let's continue with Q. Q. We need to do a partial area times a distance. And we are going to get a zero for this. We're going to get a zero for this. And here is why. Here is why. Important. If I try, so here is that not applicable cut line. If I try to get the area below that line, the partial area is equal to zero, which zeroes out that term. Okay. If I'm like, oh, well, that can't be the right way to solve this, I'll just pick the area above that line. That means I'm picking the whole cross section. But where's the center of that cross section? Oh, by definition, it lies on the axis of bending, and so the D term goes to zero, okay? Either way you think through this, your Q will always be zero at F and all of the extreme fibers, top and bottom. In other words, because you don't get a Q value for those, when you go to do your transverse shear stress equation, you also get a zero transverse shear stress. We'll do more on that in a future problem. Thanks for tuning in. That's it for this video.